Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you here at the RICS World Built Environment Forum Week. My name is Christopher Frost S. Faye. I'm currently working at the European Space Agency, and I'm joined in this session by three of my colleagues who are going to speak about lunar habitation and each from a different perspective. First, we have Melchiore Conti, who is a space resources engineer in the commercialization and innovation team at ESA. He works on the development of space resources related technologies and ground based related research facilities. And Melchiore will tell us about ESA's in situ resource utilization or ISRU strategy and some of the studies on lunar habitat concepts that have already been done. Second, we have Advanit Makaya, who is an advanced manufacturing engineer in the materials and processes team at ESA. He works on materials and manufacturing processes on Earth and in space. Advanit will do a deeper dive into the technologies and processes underlying manufacturing on the moon and beyond. And finally, we have Christian Walter, who, will, who works in the same team as myself, ESA Space Solutions, um, supporting entrepreneurs with promising business ideas that benefit from space data or technology, whether on Earth or beyond. And Christian will talk us through the work being done to encourage an eventual thriving lunar economy. So without further ado, I pass the stage to Melchiore. Thank you very much, Christopher, for your introduction. I will now give a brief overview of the strategic and programmatic aspects underpinning the requirements for human habitation uh, outside the planet Earth. To do so, I will firstly give a brief introduction to the Terra Nova, the human and robotic exploration strategy underpinning uh, the activities uh, ongoing on three uh, destinations, the low Earth orbit with the ISS, the Moon and Mars. Mars is a robotic mission in which the rover Rosalind Franklin will land on the surface of Mars and um, characterize the surface searching for the building blocks of life. Uh, the Moon with the um, creation of the gateway, a uh, structure similar to the ISS that will facilitate ascent and descent to the Moon, and of course the Argonauts, or the European Large Logistic Lander, which will carry out uh, several missions uh, bringing uh, payloads to the surface of the Moon, both for scientific purposes but also technological developments. And of course we have the International Space Station, where we have co uh, currently many missions ongoing, where humans and robots work together for long periods of time outside the planet Earth and have generated great returns uh, for Earth science and technology and create a wealth of knowledge in being able and of working and uh, living outside the planet Earth. In particular, we focus on the Moon, uh, where, according to the DG, the aspiration is to have European astronauts uh, on the surface of the Moon before the decade ends. And this is part of a larger uh, organized, organized uh, strategy, um, which is being um, developed by the ISAC-G, which is the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, looking at what are the milestones and steps required to make uh, the presence of humans on the surface of the Moon sustainable and permanent. And as part of this, we have, as you can see, several elements, but one key element is the ability to use and, and um, transform the resources that are present on the surface of the Moon. In ESA, we deal this through the Space Research Strategy that was launched in 2019, and it's um, coordinated uh, by a multi-directorate um, group called the Space Resource Steering Group, which has identified three uh, flagship goals. One is the prospecting of the lunar south pole to understand uh, whether the water present uh, in the permanently shadow regions aids uh, in quantity sufficient uh, for uh, the use of humans, uh, the development of a ISRO pilot plant capable uh, through an electrochemical system to transform uh, regolith, which is uh, the dust and ground uh, present on the surface in, of the moon in um, usable resources, and of course contingently develop applications that will be able to use these uh, resources 
creating value added and supporting the development of the lunar economy, as uh, Christian will discuss uh, in his section. But let's have a look at what are these resources. Of course, there is the energy of the sun that will be captured using uh, solar panels, but more importantly, on the surface of the moon, we will have the regolith, which is a mixture of rocks and sand, uh, which is very similar in composition to what we have on Earth, with a larger component of silicon oxide and aluminum oxide in the regolith, which once refined could be used for as metals for construction, but also isolating oxygen for uh, propulsion. And of course, uh, there is the regolith itself that can be consolidated and used uh, for construction purposes, as Advanit will um, discuss in his own section. We are looking as contribution to the Artemis program to have a pilot plant that will be capable of producing um, hundreds of kilograms of oxygen and many more of metal, uh, following three streams of work. One is the development of the technology and research facilities on Earth, uh, whilst contingently developing the Israel Demonstration Mission, which will be a mission that will demonstrate the ability of extracting uh, resources, oxygen and metals on the Moon to pave the way for the design, development and uh, delivery of our Israel pilot plant by the year 2035 onwards. As uh, we discuss about habitats, the largest uh, project is the creation of the gateway, which is uh, part of the Artemis Accord and is a joint effort of, of several space agencies, including NASA and JAXA, and of which uh, ESA will play a very important role and will facilitate ascent and descent to the surface of the Moon. And this will be one of the first habitat to be created. But looking at the Moon, uh, the Moon is a very inhospitable environment. It's exposed to vacuum, there is no atmosphere, so there is no protection from meteorites or radiation, and the dust itself has been identified by the Apollo astronauts as one of the biggest challenges for humans on the surface of the Moon. Consider that the regolith, the sand that is present on the uh, surface of the Moon is not being rounded by the weathering effects because there is no uh, atmosphere nor uh, flowing water. So it's very angular and it's very insidious because it can penetrate uh, even the suits as the photo of the astronauts um, highlights. For this reason, uh, starting in 2018, there were studies looking at how to build uh, environments, and one of these was a CDF study, a concurrent design facility study, looking at inflatable structure, multi-story inflatable structure that would have um, closed-loop regenerative uh, system for life support, will provide radiation shielding, and most importantly, dust resistance with eye locks able to segregate the environment between the outside and the inside, and of course uh, temperature controls because the Moon uh, is um, subject to very large uh, swing on temperatures, going from minus 200 to up to 550 degrees uh, centigrade, depending on the region where you find yourself. Similar studies have also been conducted uh, for Mars, but here the accent has been not just uh, an ability to survive as much as thrive, because uh, here the problem is that Mars is quite distant and is not possible to have a return journey that is calculated in days, but it takes months to go from Earth to Mars and, and coming back. So the habitat, the, 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 the building has to be in nature capable of being sustainable and being capable of um, being regenerative, creating sort of a closed loop uh, economy of the resources uh, within the structure itself. In Europe, we are developing uh, structures like the one shown in the picture, where we have uh, an inflatable environment that is capable of being housed uh, 
on the back of an EL3, the Argonauts, the larger logistic lander I introduced um, in the earlier slides. And this provides um, a safe habitat, a safe space for astronauts and potentially uh, even a way to have uh, rescue uh, locations if things uh, should go wrong. But this is not the only example. We have examples uh, of studies going on uh, through the um, Italian Space Agency that has commissioned the, studies, uh, the, 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 the study of several, uh, I think it was 20 odd um, potential habitats to be developed. And this is the uh, contribution of the Italian Space Agency to the Artemis program. And Europe, uh, a large, is poised to be a very important player in this field. Of course, what is also going on is uh, an international effort in being capable of using resources in situ. So up to now, I have described uh, payloads that will be launched from Earth and uh, will be used uh, by the astronauts, but it's still something that will come from Earth to make exploration fully sustainable uh, and enable long-term exploration, it would be required to use um, local resources. And an example of this is the uh, Centennial Challenge initiated by NASA a couple of years back in which the challenge was to build habitats using uh, mostly uh, the, 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 the regolith, in this case with uh, some uh, products and plasticizers uh, that were used to create this form of cement. But I will let Advanit uh, discuss in more details the technological aspects and what other aspects are related to the use of resources, uh, local resources for uh, long-term uh, sustainable exploration. So Advanit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mel and Chris, for the first part of the presentation. So uh, now I will uh, tell you a little bit more about how we can actually make, repair, and maintain a lunar habitat. And in particular, I'll tell you about the benefits of uh, in-situ manufacturing for the, the production, the recycling, and the maintenance of the habitat and the associated hardware. So before we do that, uh, let's have a look at the what we need in order to uh, ensure a long-term human exploration mission involving a crew. Uh, so as uh, Mel has uh, mentioned earlier, the lunar environment is very harsh. So we have to make sure that we protect the crew from this environmental condition. It involves radiation, large temperature variations, uh, vacuum, and uh, micrometeorite bombardment. So, uh, once we have done that, we also need to ensure the mobility of the crew uh, all across the exploration site. Uh, we need to protect the crew for what was identified by the Apollo astronauts as the number one challenge, which is the dust. And of course, to have a long-term exploration mission, we need to provide means for communication and also energy generation and storage. In addition to that, we need to provide the necessary hardware and spare parts in, in case anything needs to be replaced to the crew. The crew needs to be able to, uh, to, to dress themselves, so they need clothing, uh, they need food, and they also need medical care when, when needed. So on this chart, you see a picture on the left of the uh, supplies in uh, cargo vehicle for the International Space Station. So as you can see, the supplies, uh, which are, by the way, mostly spares in case something happens, the supplies apply, uh, occupy a very large volume and uh, represents a very high mass. Uh, so on the right here, you have uh, the benefits of what would happen if we are able to manufacture in situ the hardware that's needed instead of having to ship all the supplies from Earth. So that's the blue bar at the center of the chart. And the green bar is if you add to the in situ manufacturing capability, the possibility to recycle, to reuse the materials that you ship once from Earth. 
Uh, and there again, you have a significant decrease in the, the amount of things, the volume and the mass that you need to ship from Earth. Uh, so in the context of uh, building a lunar habitat and a sustainable lunar base, we should, as much as possible, uh, make use of in-situ manufacturing capability using the resources that we have available in the exploration uh, site. So it can be resources which are already there or resources that we bring and which are not used anymore. Uh, things like packaging, equipment which has reached the end of, the end of their life. So um, use as much as possible the resources available locally and uh, use as much as possible the possibility to manufacture directly on site. So we have identified the needs for a lunar habitat. Uh, we now uh, look at the solutions, uh, keeping in mind this possibility to, to use in situ manufacturing and local resources. So the first need we talked about was the shielding. So here you have a number of technologies that uh, ESA and other agencies have been looking at to transform the um, uh, the regolith into a construction material. So the regolith is the most abundant resource that you have locally on the lunar surface. It is this mixture of sand and rocks uh, that's covering the surface. So the first way to con convert this into a construction material is to use what we call a binder. It is a, a chemical substance that you can either bring from Earth for in most cases or in specific cases manufacture with, uh, directly with local resources, for example, using uh, urea. Uh, and uh, this binder will help stick the grains together and transform the, the regolith powder into a solid construction material. But that uh, implies most of the time that you ship relatively large quantities of binder from Earth. So another way of transforming regolith into a construction material is to uh, use heat to partially fuse or completely fuse the, the regolith grains together. So we have been looking at uh, various processes at ESA and outside ESA, uh, using, for example, concentrated sunlight, microwaves, or lasers. After the sheltering, the shielding of the, of the crew, we have uh, identified the mobility as, a, as an essential need for a sustainable lunar exploration mission. Uh, and there again, we can use construction processes to um, facilitate the mobility by flattening the ground, for example, or by um, avoiding huge dust clouds when the vehicle is, uh, is moving on the surface. Uh, so using similar processes to the ones we have looked at for the shielding, we can uh, process the regolith to make tiles which can be applied on the surface or, for example, to uh, consolidate the, uh, the ground using concentrated sunlight or microwaves. We have also identified energy uh, generation and storage as an, as an essential need. Uh, so here you have an example of um, a family of processes to extract silicon from the regolith using bacteria, bi biological processes or chemical, electrochemical processes. And this silicon can be used to manufacture uh, solar cells. When it comes to energy storage, we have conducted a couple of studies on using regolith bricks, uh, so manufacturing and using regolith brick to store the thermal energy. So uh, not optimal because the uh, regolith has limitation in terms of thermal connectivity, for example, but uh, potentially useful since regolith is, uh, is uh, available in abundance on the linear surface. When it comes to hardware, uh, we have looked at processes to directly use the regolith to, uh, to manufacture spare parts tooling uh, using, for example, additive manufacturing processes used on Earth for ceramics, for uh, medical applications, for example. Applying these terrestrial processes to regolith turned out to be useful to uh, achieve parts with very high uh, geometrical accuracy all with local materials, or mostly with local materials. 
if you introduce small elements uh, of materials brought from Earth, for example, a plasticizer, you can also make uh, ceramic plastic uh, parts and tools uh, using uh, using the local regolith. The material that's uh, the most uh, widely used for uh, for tools and spare parts on Earth is metal, and uh, regolith is actually a combination of oxides. So, by applying processes, chemical, electrochemical, we can extract the, the metal from these oxides uh, and use this metal uh, to process these metals using processes such as additive manufacturing, which are, which are well known on Earth, uh, to manufacture uh, spare parts, tools, in situ during a, a long-term DNA exploration campaign. We have looked at processes involving the regolith, the material widely available on the surface. We can also look at processes to use materials that we bring from Earth. Uh, it can be materials that we bring for the purpose of manufacturing on a, on a, in an exploration mission, or materials, as we mentioned earlier, which are not used anymore, packaging, uh, equipment which, which has reached its end of life. And we can recycle those materials to manufacture the equipment and the tools that we need. Another source of materials which is very interesting is also space debris, so end-of-life spacecraft, which are in uh, on orbit uh, around, the, around the Earth, uh, which are a source of material, various types of material, mostly metals like aluminum alloys, uh, which we could theoretically bring to the linear surface to use it as uh, construction and manufacturing materials. Here you see an example of a, a study we did on uh, using the type of aluminum that are in launcher upper stages, rocket upper stages, to manufacture using uh, lunar regolith as a mold. So the idea of uh, using and reusing the materials which are available uh, increases the sustainability of, uh, of a lunar mission. We have mentioned the need for uh, for food, so there, uh, additive manufacturing is uh, is, is uh, studied on Earth for uh, for food application. Uh, so, why 3D printed food print, printing food, uh, in addition to being uh, visually uh, interesting, it also provides the possibility to vary the texture, the shape, uh, the color, even of uh, of uh, food items. Uh, which is particularly interesting when you have a limited set of ingredients, like uh, like on the lunar surface. Uh, so providing this variety increases the uh, the morale, can boost the morale of the of the crew of the astronauts uh, by uh, breaking the monotony in the the type of food that they that they consume. And a very essential need for long-term exploration mission, even more so for Mars, where the return. Earth will be not practical is the, the medical care and there again using the developments in bioprinting, three-dimensional bioprinting here on Earth, we could translate such uh, technologies to uh, manufacture uh, medical items and even organs in a long-term exploration mission, for example skin patches for, for graphs or even bones for uh, for uh, to to treat fractures uh, in the context of uh, an injury during a long term exploration mission. So when it comes to to summarize a little bit about the the perspectives for uh, for construction and manufacturing industry actors here on Earth uh, for your community. Uh, so the challenge of developing technologies for long-term lunar exploration, where you have limited uh, available resources, limited access to energy, uh, limited access to manpower, manpower to, to, to perform manual maintenance operations. Addressing those challenges can uh, lead to significantly increased sustainability, which can be translated to terrestrial uh, technologies as well. So uh, if you are able to do that in space, then you can develop processes which will be less resource hungry, less energy uh, hungry 
here on Earth with uh, increased automation, increased autonomy uh, when it comes to maintenance. And we don't expect uh, terrestrial construction of manufacturing industry to, to, to be ready to apply the processes on the moon. But what we would expect is that such industry works hand in hand with people who know about the space environment, who know about space systems development, and that dialogue, uh, that uh, cross-fertilization of, uh, of expertise uh, is, we think, what is needed to address the challenges of uh, manufacturing, maintaining, and operating a linear habitat. So on this, I give the floor to uh, Christian, who will put everything we have presented in the context of a growing linear economy. Thank you. Thank you and hi. I'm Christian Walter. I work for ESA Space Solutions and I would like to tell you about business opportunities related to the emerging lunar economy. We are going back to the moon. More than 250 missions are planned in the next decade. And the lunar economy was predicted to be worth 100 billion US dollars. ESA is involved in several lunar initiatives and programs. One of them is Moonlight, bringing communication and navigation services to the moon for everyone to use. Let me show you a brief teaser of what is planned. We're going back to the moon. For the first time in more than half a century, humans will walk on the moon again. But this time, will feel closer. In the decades since we've been away, the giant leaps have happened here. The people on our planet have learned to thrive in a digital world, a connected world. The people who next walk on the moon will now be able to enjoy this same connectivity because of ESA's Moonlight Initiative. A lunar constellation of satellites and base stations providing seamless connectivity back to Earth allowing new possibilities for discovery. To communicate. To navigate. And to explore our place in the universe more deeply than ever before. With more countries than ever set to embark on their own lunar programs, Moonlight will support a permanent lunar space station that will orbit the moon a gateway to these further journeys. So instead of going back, we can go forward to the moon, together, and this time, to stay. Moonlight will help us safely touch down on the surface and touch base with our colleagues and loved ones once we're there, keeping us constantly connected with home as we venture further and further away from it, pushing the boundaries of science and exploration beyond our planet, beyond the moon and Mars, beyond our imaginations. To recap, Moonlight will offer communication and navigation services on the Moon. Communication services such as data transfer between assets on the moon or between assets on the moon and on earth, data streaming of video and audio for example, teleoperation services to control assets on the moon remotely from earth, and navigation services similar to satellite navigation down on earth to determine position, velocity and time. So, once we have established connectivity between the Moon and the Earth or on the lunar surface, as well as lunar navigation and positioning services, how might a lunar economy actually look like? Let's imagine the future in some decades. We might have established a sustainable lunar presence, perhaps initially by machines, then followed by humans. What are some of the applications that we might need to enable this? 
and how could they benefit from lunar navigation or communication capabilities. One of these application areas relates to the prospecting, extraction, storage and distribution of resources such as water, soil, metals, etc. Water, for example, can be broken into oxygen and hydrogen, which is useful for life support and as propellant. Lunar communications can enable a continuous monitoring and remote control of these assets, while lunar navigation can allow asset tracking via positioning. One key enabler is energy. Energy needs to be generated, for example, via solar cells that convert sunlight into electricity, stored in fixed or mobile batteries, and distributed, for example, via power grids, energy supply vehicles, and fuel stations. Moonlight can interconnect all these elements in a smart Internet of Things like Lunar Network. Communication services can allow remote monitoring and control of such energy infrastructure and navigation and positioning services can allow for asset tracking and also support the energy management. With the resources and energy available, our presence on the moon could be further advanced. Roads, machinery parts and other building blocks may be needed to construct a permanent lunar presence. And moonlight communications and navigation services can help mapping the environment using georeferenced sensor data, prospecting and extracting resources, transporting resources or building infrastructure via mobile vehicles or robots, and coordinating or monitoring construction activities. Lunar soil, regolith, is one of the lunar resources that could be used as material for construction or extracting elements such as metals. Certainly innovative manufacturing technologies and processes are needed using in situ resources as much as possible. Habitats protect humans from the harsh conditions in space such as large temperature differences, lack of oxygen, impacts or radiation. The combination of communication and positioning capabilities can enable services for mapping and surveying suitable areas, property management, construction, support for human activities in the field, hazard monitoring or search and rescue operations, for example. Transport and mobility services can help with the storage exchange and transport of resources and goods, as well as with the mobility of humans. Lunar communication and navigation can help with mapping the lunar environment via geo-referenced measurements of the lunar topography, route planning services for the vehicles and moving assets, or with traffic management on the surface or in orbit. With the moon more and more connected and accessible, we may want some entertainment and education to empower lunar inhabitants and audiences on Earth. Voice and data communication uh, could uh, connect astronauts with their families and friends on Earth. Virtual reality or augmented reality could offer immersive experiences and video games and rely on positioning and connectivity, and movie productions um, or luxury tourism uh, could be applications that are a little bit further out in the future. These are of course just some of the many application areas that could be supported by Moonlight. To recap, 
we are going back to the moon. More than 250 missions are planned in the next decade. There are many application areas involved in supporting a sustainable lunar presence. And Moonlight aims to offer lunar communication and navigation services for anyone. This opens up opportunities for innovative businesses. Now, we want your business ideas. We look for promising business ideas for new service concepts that benefit from Moonlight's capabilities and that address relevant customer and user needs. To stimulate the lunar economy, we plan to launch a competition and award up to 200,000 euros for studies to develop and assess selected business ideas. In return, we look for attractive market opportunities and customer demand, commercially viable service concepts, technically feasible solutions, an added value by Moonlight's capabilities, and motivated teams with business and domain expertise. Important to emphasize here that we do not only look for space companies, but for companies also specialized in domains such as construction, manufacturing or energy. The question is, what would you build with lunar communication and navigation ready to use? I invite you to visit our website and to register to our newsletter and look forward to receiving your business ideas soon. Thank you.